Thank you all for coming out today to uh, uh, see this uh, particular marketing talk at Google. Uh, it's an ongoing series that we have here at Google, which is, uh, which is great. And we have these great speakers coming in um, every few weeks. So definitely look out for more emails from the uh, marketing team on that. Uh, today I'd like to uh, uh, present to you guys uh, Hashim Bajwa, who is the digital planning um, director at Goodby Silverstein and Partners. They're based in San Francisco. They have one office, uh, 500 people there working as a creative agency to manage the likes of clients like the HP business, uh, the NBA, Sprint, Comcast, very large clients, uh, really innovative in their solutions. Um, so Hashim's role is more around uh, being the digital, quote unquote, the digital librarian for the agency. So he's coming in and he's talking to the account planners and the new media folks to really inject creative ways of, about thinking about technology and the digital media into marketing campaigns. So to give you a little background on, uh, on Goodby, uh, Goodby was, became really famous for their work on the Got Milk campaign. I don't know if you guys probably remember this from the early 90s. It's still ongoing today, but they've, they've kind of put a new spin on it, which uh, Hashim will talk a little bit more about today. Um, they've also, I don't know if you guys have seen the TV commercials, the computer is personal again uh, from HP. You've probably seen those. And uh, the Comcast as well, Comcast commercials. So they've done a lot of stuff when it comes to offline. And Hashim's role is kind of moving into the digital space. And he's done a really great job at Goodby to really work more closely with Google. Um, so he's been really pushing as far as early adoption of Google products in marketing campaigns. So uh, we had a click-to-play video ads product that launched last year that was uh, very instrumental in our early beta test with Saturn, one of their clients from last year. Um, new YouTube ad formats are always being tested by Goodby clients. And Google Gadget ads, for example, were run by <coughs> the NBA and the H HP folks this year as well. So a lot of great early adoption that, that Hashim is helping push and lead within the agency. Uh, he basically started off um, at the UN. He had a couple of years experience at the UN and then worked at uh, the McCann uh, Ericsson World Group. Then I sold out and went into advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, then he came over to the, uh, the advertising world, and it's been a, a good be for a few years. Um, so he has actually been involved with a lot of different thought leadership -ish, uh, conferences at Google. So one is the Video Ads Consortium, where he's actually helping create standards for video advertising across a, you know, various industry panelists, including Google um, and other uh, in the IAB, et cetera. And he also presented earlier <coughs> this year in June um, at the second annual CMO Summit here in Mountain View. And so he was uh, definitely a great speaker in that, at that event. Earlier this year, he was uh, named, he, doesn't, he didn't want me to talk about this, but he was named um, one of the 40 under 40 to watch um, in, by Ad Age, so by Advertising Age uh, magazine. So uh, that's actually a very big honor. And last year, he was named Goodby's Employee of the Year after only being there for less than two years. And so... Uh, really great honors that, that we have uh, for him to, to be here and talk to us. And um, yeah, I'll cool. give it to you, Hashim. Thanks, all. That was a long. Give him a warm welcome. All right, thanks. <laughs> that was a that was a, a really long introduction, and he forgot to mention that I'm an overdresser because I thought this was being on YouTube where I should dress up properly, but then I realized it's Google, and this is not really part of the wardrobe. So I apologize for that. I'm not. Uh, I'll make up for it by hopefully being somewhat funny. But um, two quick disclaimers before I jump into some of the stuff that I'm going to show you. Um, I, find, I find I learned two things from sort of different presentations like this. One is that most people, with the exception of like Bill Clinton and the Dalai Lama, are really boring. And so it's, people, I think, tend to want to see stuff and sort of share things and learn things that way. So I'm going to spend most of this presentation showing some work we've done that I think are more practical examples of, of this idea of, of change in marketing. Uh, and the second thing I learned is that the people in the audience are probably as interesting as people who tend to be up on stage. So Zal had promised me that I would do this and that afterwards we would have a really interesting conversation together with you um, and with questions and things. So please interrupt and, and we'll just sort of have a chat. Keep, keep it quite simple. So love change. That's the, this, this, this image was something we did for HP for their uh, business group. And it was an ad that was um, aimed at CIOs. And it had this copy. I just want to read it for you. It's, learn to love what you've been taught to fear. Act more quickly. Find more value. Always look for the upside. See that change is opportunity's nickname. 
And you know, change is something we talk about in marketing left and right. It's become this ridiculous buzz phrase, this cliche thing. Um, you know, everybody's talking about it. But you know, the trades talk about change is happening, change is coming. What, what is it going to mean for this brand or for this advertiser? This is just one quote from, from uh, this idea I want to bring out. Advertisements are now so numerous that they are very negligently pursued. And it has therefore become necessary to gain attention by magnificence of promises and by eloquence, uh, sometimes sublime and, and sometimes pathetic. The really great thing about this is that this was said in 1759 by a guy in the UK. Um, so you can imagine this issue of change is definitely not a new one. And I would say that change is just a constant. And if you can deal with that, you can actually, if you just look at it as an opportunity, it can be much more exciting. Uh, and our company has had to deal with that really profoundly in that we became famous by everything that is traditional and old television spots, big mass media. That ad I showed you on the front was part of a 20-page insert that we ran in newspapers four years ago. We spent millions, if not more, you know, for our clients on traditional mass media. And now we're trying to figure out sort of where do we go from there. <coughs> 1961 was also an interesting year. Mad Men, this, I don't know if anyone's seen this, this show, but sort of chronicles 1960s and the craziness of advertising on Madison Avenue, where all the ad agencies were at that time. And you know. Things haven't changed all that much. People don't dress quite as sharp. Women within the business have certainly rose in prominence. We don't drink in the office quite as much. Afterwards, yes, but not during. Um, but we still have problems with that as well. I mean, our company, to be very blunt and honest with you, we have no women partners. And that's a problem, and we're trying to fix that. So there are still challenges that have not been fixed from 1960s, which we would easily say is such a different time. Then in 1961, this happened. The Nixon-Kennedy debates, and I think you guys are probably familiar with this, but this was their big drama, was that television came onto the scene. And oh my god, these great art-directed posters that we created that was advertising is now going to be rocked by this. And this was dramatically changing that. And I think now we could actually sort of make a comparison in some ways to this, which you guys all know about the CNN YouTube debates. But that's not the man. He's old news. He's much better. He looks better. He's younger. He's hipper. He's more YouTube. And for us, this is a really interesting time. And, and Google is a company for, which is really compelling, I think. You either love Google or you litigate against it. And our company has really kind of liked it. And I think that's why I wanted to come here and talk about this idea of change, because this is a place where change is happening and where we, from our point of view as a, as a steward of a lot of different brands, uh, want to make sure that we understand what those changes are. So that's par partially why I wanted to come here today. I'm going to try to show three simple stories of change, I guess. And they're for three different brands that we've worked with, very practical examples. The first one was for a global brand that has had to sort of move itself from a traditional marketing environment to the new world, and that's HP. They're the original two guys in a garage, I like to think. Uh, the I, next brand is going to be an iconic campaign that has actually become victim of its own success, which is Got Milk. And the third thing is going to be about Saturn, a car company that we no longer work with, but is a car company that basically has had to merge digital and the physical world in some different ways to get away from the old car business of tricks, discounts, and sleazy dealers. So I'm going to start off with this quote from Tom Perkins, who founded Kleiner Perkins, a VC company. And he said, if HBO produced sushi, they would advertise it and they call it cold dead fish. And I think that's really true. In fact, in 2005, these were the ads they sold for computers. And they basically were long lists of prices, you know, numbers to call, you know, this much megabytes, this much megahertz. And the only thing that ever stood out about this advertising that they did was the Intel logo, which was the drug for these kinds of companies because of the amount of money that they spent to be a part of that. So we were asked to sort of pitch this business. And we uncovered sort of an insight, which was several things. But one was people were asked, if you had to give up your television or your computer, what would you give up? And 80% said they'd give up their television before they would give up their computer. And so that began us sort of thinking, well, yeah, the computer actually is a really unique thing to me. It's probably the most personal thing I own. It's my backup brain. It's my autobiography, in fact. And I use it to access so much. And of course, what's happening right now is a lot of what's on the computer is now moving off the computer. This company knows that very well. But the computer is still the device by which we get to a lot of that. So how can we embrace that and actually talk about the computer, this technology, this sort of box, in a way that's more compelling and more personal? And so we said, we're going to call the computers personal again. PC is what we've turned it into. 
the personal computer has become this an, a sort of terrible, terrible abbreviation of PC. Dell entered into the environment and they said, right, well, it is, it is a commodity. and We're going to sell it dirt cheap and we're not going to care anything more than that. You'll get it fast and quick and that's all that people cared about. This campaign launched and we said, no, we're going to actually take credit for what you actually do in the computer. We're not going to let Intel do it. We're not going to let Microsoft do it. The computer is where that place happens. So we came upon this tagline. And I want to show a spot that we launched this thing about a year and a half ago with. And it was a 60 second ad that ran on a roadblock. So this means it ran at 8 p.m. on essentially every cable network, um, uh, cable station. And that was how we launched it. I think we had made some mistakes in doing that. But I want to show the spot and then talk about that. I got my whole life in this thing. Check out this new song I'm mixing. Still rough. All artists say that. Got the new uh, Rock Aware campaign. Shot it in Aspen. I think it's kind of cool. Love playing chess online. Hold on. This game is over. I wonder if he knows. Vacation photos you won't see in the tabloids. Uh, new Frank Gary plans for my team in Brooklyn. See that? Cool. Just start organizing my world tour. Trying to be a rock star and a role model. Got to track all my investments because I'm retired, right? <laughs> my passport says Sean, but you may know me by another name. Howard. HP Pavilion Entertainment Notebooks with Intel Centrino Dual Mobile Technology. The computer is personal again. Couldn't escape the Intel. <laughs> but so if our strategy was computers personal again, the creative representation of that strategy was to talk about really interesting people that you wouldn't necessarily associate in the past with HP and tell their lives through their computer, which is why your heads are cut off and you focus on what they do inside of it. We spent a lot of money to launch the campaign and it achieved a big objective, PR for the brand. And this sort of, we went away from that price point stuff to actually something that meant something to people. But the wastage was, who, who saw it? We ran, ran it on prime time. I'm sure we have an approximation of media numbers of who saw it. But there was nothing more beyond that. There was very little of an online presence and it's kind of ironic because here is a technology company, it's a computer. Why are we not creating things that are interactive and engaging? So we started to sort of take that learning and that mistake and sort of channel it into the next iteration of the campaign over the next year. So this next bit, we worked with Jerry Seinfeld and we actually targeted it in a lot closer. We said instead of just being so broad with Jay-Z, let's focus in on comedy because that's an area that's interesting to a certain sect of people. Let's be more relevant to a smaller group of people and create an experience that plays out what he's known for but ties into the brand well. So we created a, a site that we, we partnered with StumbleUpon. And I want to show you the site and explain what that was. So this launched a few months ago. And we wanted to sort of say, well, what does Jerry Seinfeld think is funny? And what do you think is funny? And how can we bring those two things together? So it was in partially to promote his movie, The Bee Movie. I'll show you the video that was running across the Google Ad Network and other online video. Well, if I'm going to do one of those HP computer hand commercial things, I got to be impressive. Here's my newly designed basketball stadium. Wait, that's not me. This is more me. But I'm always looking for new places. This place looks cool. I don't think I'd feel comfortable there. Oh, sorry. I did a TV show about New York, and now I've made a movie that takes place in New York, except in this, I'm a babe. <laughs> I can't believe I'm out. Hang on, message from the wife. Oh, it's a manuscript for her new cookbook that gets kids eating better without them knowing it. There's carrots in there, you know. Yeah. She's a genius. Ow. Oh, sorry again. Can I have a moment to myself so I can follow the game with my baseball gadget? Oh, and you're out of there. Oh, message from DreamWorks. Don't forget two B-movie mentions in HP Spot. Fine. That's two. You know what? This is a business lunch. The HP Pavilion Entertainment Notebook with Windows Vista Home Premium. The computer is personal again. Okay, so down at the bottom you see there's these Paulo Coelho, Petra Nemkova, Serena Williams, some different people and personalities that have been part of the campaign. But in the past when we've done these people on the web, we've created these big microsites and we've hoped that people will come to the microsite. We didn't necessarily think through how people were going to get there. It's like building a castle in the middle of a forest and not thinking how people are going to actually get through the forest to get there. Here we tried to do something a little bit different. We worked with StumbleUpon, 
does, do, do you guys know about StumbleUpon? Shall I quickly explain it? Most I see mixed. Okay. So StumbleUpon works based on you set your profile. Say I'm interested in comedy. I'm interested in entertainment. I'm interested in technology. And then it lets you discover different sites like that. So up here in my menu bar, I've got I like it, I dislike it. Hit Stumble. Every time I hit Stumble, I get a new website that's based on my interests. So it's actually very personal to me. And if I like it or dislike it, it learns from me. So it's something interesting that we thought, well, what if we partnered with a company like that to make this kind of site a little bit more interesting? So instead of just building a big, flashy microsite, let's actually tie together other partners and use their assets with ours to make something new and better. So one of the options is Stumble Upon Funny. And it's a new video. <laughs> And you can just mark whether it's funny or not funny at the bottom. Thumbs up, thumbs down. And that goes to Jerry Seinfeld as well. And so essentially you're sharing with him what you think is funny. And it gives you a new video. <coughs> I don't know what this is. I'm going to spare you from... Well, let's see what it is. Want some ice? That's all right. I'm sure you've seen the Mentos thing. I'm not going to spare this so we can move on to some other bits. But that, that was our way of sort of tying the brand in with another asset and creating a bit of entertainment, but something that's also kind of useful, and it's, it's around comedy. So it was a more narrow, narrow, sort of a little more niche target. So that was Jerry Seinfeld. Now, how do you do this when you don't have a big celebrity like Jerry Seinfeld backing your campaign? How can you do it in a more relevant way? We had a really interesting challenge. The HP to surprise of some, actually does make phones. And they recently launched this thing called the Voice Messenger. And this is a product that you can only buy direct from HP. You couldn't actually go into a store and touch it and see it. And the challenge was to get this to business people who are on the go and are kind of multitasking. And this is an interesting thing, because it was reviewed by Walt Mossberg, and he just ripped it apart. He called it the robotic voice that reads email is bad, suffers from the same problems all voice operated devices have. It has one interesting feature. It lets you actually, uh, through voice recognition, dictate emails and send those emails. And then in the other direction, take an email and read it back to you. So in essence, you can sort of, it's your personal voice that can shape your emails if you don't have it, you know, sit there typing it on the phone. So we thought that was an interesting feature, and it's very personal, but he was sort of tearing it apart. So what do we do when the press is saying it's a terrible feature, yet we think it's something that's very personal to this campaign. We don't have a big celebrity. How can we do something that's not as flashy or glitzy, but is more relevant and maybe more useful? Now, another problem was this guy. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. So we had, we, had, we had a thought, which was HP was saying, OK, well, Walt Mossberg loved the battery power. Let's talk about the battery power. That's a, that's a feature that Walt Mossberg thinks is a good feature on this phone. But in the context of the iPhone, in the context of our campaign, which is the computer and the technology you have is personal, how can you talk about battery power and make that a compelling proposition to consumers? Because everybody claims to have battery power that matters. So we thought that was kind of dull. And instead, we wanted to come up with a, something a little bit different. We work with a company called Federated Media, which you may be familiar with. It's sort of a, essentially a loose collection of different blog sites like Boing Boing, TechCrunch, um, WebAlert, and, and several others. Dignation is one of them. And we said, what could we do to take this really compelling feature and create a utility for people that they can actually use? And so together with them, with us, with creative people, with their engineers and their technical people, we came up with this idea of voice posts. And I'm going to explain it to you in a second. But the way that that process came about was very different for us. Instead of the traditional marketing model of create, figure out the insight into the consumer, develop a strategy, push that out to the client, make sure the client's OK with it, and then brief it into the creative teams to come up with the ad. We said, maybe there's no ad. Maybe we can actually do something different that would be marketing. And so we decided to call this voice post. And what we did is we took the feature and functionality of this phone, gave it to some of these bloggers, and said, do whatever you want with it. You can rip it apart, or you can use it in your own blogs. Can we bring your voice? Because a blog is essentially a voice. It's someone's opinion, someone's style. You read Boing Boing because of their quirky, offbeat character. How can we actually allow them to put voice into what they do? So we created voice posts. And we didn't dictate what they could say or do. 
It was all entirely up to them. There was no editorial sort of direction. And so here's an example. John Battelle, who uh, wrote the book The Search, founded Wired magazine, he runs a blog called Search Blog. And he did this uh, here. I'm just going to play it. It was this little function that added into these blogs. Hey, Search Blog readers. It's John Battelle calling into my voice posting box <coughs> for the first time. Um, Hewlett Packard is sponsoring this, which is really cool, particularly given that my wrist, or rather hand, is broken, and uh, it's nice to be able to post by voice. So I wanted to post about a couple of things. The first was that um, last week I had a dinner, a Web 2.0 dinner. So he goes on, he talks about you know, Google and some of the news that his site normally covers. But he was able to sort of talk about it, even though his hand was broken, and it was a way of adding some personalization to the site. And this doesn't have it anymore, but there was an HP logo, and it mentioned the phone. You can click through to a site that we had some product information on that device. The idea behind this actually was maybe people are not going to necessarily buy that phone over the iPhone, but it does put HP in a more innovative position, and it provides some usefulness to people. Adrian Ho, who used to be planning director at Fallon, he now runs a company called Zeus Jones, uh, a marketing ad agency style company. He sort of coined this phrase, marketing as a service. And I, I hope he'll forgive me, but I'm going to borrow it from him, because I believe this is the kind of thing that is doing that. It's creating services for people that is useful, not just advertising that bombards them with a the message. I'll show one other one from Boing Boing. Boing Boing took a totally different approach. He said, we're not going to talk about our news. We're, gonna, we're just going to do something random. Hi, this is Mark Frauenfelder from boingboing.net. I wanted to read an excerpt to you from my book, The World's Worst, A Guide to the Most Disgusting, Hideous, Inept, and Dangerous People, Places, and Things on Earth. It was published by Chronicle Books in 1995. And the excerpt I wanted to read to you... So he goes on. I will swear. He reads the first chapter of his book. And he couldn't have done that before, but this allowed him to do that. And it became something that we found people who read Boing Boing were saying, hey, I want to have that functionality on my blog. How do I get it? How can we integrate this? So it allowed us to sort of explore some conversation, some interaction, and, and a different way of talking to people, I think. So there was no flashy microsite. There was no web component. It was just a really functional, interesting tool that now is across many, many different sites that people were talking about. We took a little bit different spin with HP's printing division, but along that same strategy. So I find when I go into meetings, I either have my laptop, or if I don't, there's oftentimes things I want to print out from the web that are interesting, articles, blog posts, other stuff. But if you print anything from the web, it just becomes really complicated. You've got banner ads in the print ad. You've got all kinds of stuff that are not formatted properly. HP has the ability to format a website really nicely, header it, make it very presentable, and allow you to output and print it. And part of the new campaign, which the tagline is, what do you have to say, is about self-expression and creating physical artifacts that you might not otherwise think are useful or relevant. So what we did was they, they primarily led this with their own technology, but I think this is marketing as a service as well. And they went to many blogs. We helped sort of facilitate relationships with Boing Boing and TechCrunch. And they incorporated this thing, which is a small print button that sits on the page. And it's an HP branded print element that you can click on for any post on that page or multiple posts. You can select which ones you want. And a small dialog box comes up lets you output a PDF that then you can print out or send to someone. And I'll show you an example of it on TechCrunch. So this is today. Google takes on global warming. No surprise, there's a Google headline at the very top of TechCrunch. And at the very bottom is print posts. When you click this, you've got a little pop-up that comes up that's HP branded. It takes all the articles that are recent in the RSS feed and lets you customize what you want in it and then output it or print it or send it as a PDF. To us, this is, this is what's the value of this? This is a brand utility that's now on every post across a whole wide range of different kinds of interesting uh, bloggers and, and websites. Then that entire technology you can embed on your own blog. It's very simple, it's a small little plug-in, a bit of HTML code you drop in. That's as powerful, I think, as doing a compelling website or a big television spot. That value will live on in multiple ways, and the brand is there. So the big question, of course, is did this, any of this work? Or was this all an experiment that really didn't get us anywhere? We were some mistakes, we learned some things. The big result was that HP did overtake Dell uh, earlier this year, and <coughs> Dell continues to lose market share. The real issue now, the question we have, is can, can we take on an Apple that has a very different set of strengths? Uh, HP increased market share globally, and Dell now is behind. So we think it was successful in, in, in doing that. I want to quickly move now to Milk. So this, was an icon this is a campaign that I think 99% of people are, are probably aware of in the US. It's become a brand that uh, became iconic in the early 90s. It's almost 15 years old. 
And it's become actually a liability in some ways. Because now it's been spoofed so many times. Got porn, got hash, got many different things. And the, the point of it is it lost its value in many ways, because no, it's no longer distinct about milk. And this came off a really clear strategy. You only think about milk when you don't have it. You know, cereal, you've got cereal, but you don't have milk. You only think about it when you don't have the product. And 15 years ago, this is how that looked. And that was the Vienna Wood Dancing D, one of my all-time favorites. And now, let's make that random call with today's $10,000 question. It's a tough one. Who shot Alexander Hamilton in that famous duel? All right, let's go to the phones and see who's out there. Hello? Hello, for $10,000, who shot... Hello, Excuse me? Hello, <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid your time is almost up. I'm sorry, maybe next time. <laughs> got milk. So that, that ushered in Got Milk. And that was done 15 years ago, directed by Michael Bay. And the rumor goes that the two founders of our company, um, one a writer, one a, an art director, one visual one in text, things in type. Uh, one wrote on a napkin in the meeting with milk, got milk, question mark. And then the other one, Rich Silverstein, crumpled up and said, that's just ridiculous, and tossed it out. And only later, when he was able to put some visualization to it, did it actually sort of resurface and come back. That made the agency famous in a lot of ways, and it was based on television, um, on, on a great strategy and a great execution of that. Fifteen years later, when the campaign is no longer working the same way, what do we do to make it relevant? That was the sort of question we had. And to do that, we decided to create a web experience that took a little bit different strategy. Instead of, oops, here we go. So instead of just talking about how you only think about milk when you don't have it, we started talking about health benefits. And we thought, let's create a game. We were really obsessed with board games. And so what if we create a game online where you learn about the benefits of milk? Things like it reduces the symptoms of PMS, that it helps with hair loss, even though I have lost my hair. And it helps with brittle bones. I mean, there's some really interesting positives about milk. So can we transition this thing, which was all about when you don't have milk, to thinking about some of the positive things about that? So we created this site called gettheglass.com. We created a fictional family who is suffering from all of these ailments that I just mentioned. And their objective is to get the glass at the very top of the final glass of milk on the planet Earth. We took the idea of losing, not having milk a little bit too far and said there's only one glass left. And I'm going to show to you the site and we'll just play a little bit of it. So there's a bit of an opening that explains Got this. Milk. The Adachi family, a family run amok family struggling to overcome a staggering predicament, life without milk. Only one thing may help them, the power of the glass. Countless illegal attempts to get the glass have made the Adachis a family of fugitives on the run. Will you briefly cast everyday morals aside and help them in their final attempt to break into Fort Fridge and get the glass? And then you can play the game, and instead of playing it, I'm just going to play a sort of canned video because I don't think my internet connection will work quite as well. <coughs> it works just like a board game. The family introduces themselves, and then you walk them through the site. Dice, that's navigation, you can pick it up and throw it across the screen. And this isn't a support game. So here's about milk and muscles and sort of basketball coach of the sun. And every maybe four or five turns you get spotted by the police for chasing this family of thieves. 
tries to track you down. If you can outrun them, you're clear. If not... We're in hot pursuit of suspect Adachi Walter, attempting to reach Fort Bridge. Looks like he's gonna outdrive play a game us. Try to out, out, outdo them. Navigate the truck. If you get caught, you go to milk a tries. And then you can continue to play it. So, so that was milk, and the site actually really did very well. It had about average time spent on it was about five minutes. People who actually got to the end of the game actually did got a glass that was sent to them that had a logo on it. Um, and about a million people went to it within the first week. So the site performed really well. It was bringing entertainment. It was in, sort of delivering messages about milk. It was a different strategy. And so now we continue to sort of try to evolve it. Instead of doing funny television spots, how can we make really engaging websites? We also did it with really very realistic graphics. We shot models. We brought a different level of production to what we had been doing on the web. And that was part of that entertainment value. And I think also part of how the web is changing and how we can create some experiences that do have that kind of uh, uh, look and feel. The last thing I want to talk about is Saturn. I want to just sort of preface it by showing a couple of things that I think is a trend that Saturn was able to sort of exploit. One is the digital world is becoming more real, and the real world is becoming much more digital. You know, this is Nike Plus, which uh, very, very sort of extravagant site that has a lot of community features that takes what you do from your shoe and your running and brings it up into a site that you can share with other people. So you're bringing the real world up into a digital experience. You guys, of course, know this one. Street View is bringing real world imagery into the web. Uh, and making it functional and useful. This is our parking lot. That's Rich Silverstein's red Porsche. He freaked out when he saw this. And then um, physical objects are actually getting this sort of newer digital meaning. So if, this, is, this is an ad that was done for Clinique. It ran in um, bus stops, I believe. And at the very bottom, it has PayPal's text to buy feature. So if you have an account set up with uh, PayPal Mobile, you can text to purchase that product. Or you can do it for DVDs or some other sort of smaller item uh, purchases. But it was taking outdoor advertising and making it interactive by adding this mobile component. Uh, I'll try the next one is. This next one is pretty interesting. This one uh, I just learned about recently. And it's called React Tea. And it's a company based here uh, in the mission, actually. And the idea is you can go on the site and create your own t-shirt. You can come up with your own slogan, uh, stop AIDS, need a dog walker, uh, preserve the Arctic. Maybe it's for a cause. Maybe you have a band. And you can create a text uh, short code that could say something like, you know, find out more about AIDS or come check out my band. And you can then customize the colors, the look of it, and get the shirt sent to you. And so I did one. I thought it was funny, but some people got upset with me about it. And it said, a daily hit of hash. <laughs> and then you just sort of text in my name to the short code. And you get a little feed from my blog, which is just like a daily hit of sort of new media stuff. Um, but I thought it was kind of cool, but I got in trouble at the agency for that. I don't know why. I don't know why. It's something about illegalities. Um, but, but here you're, you're taking mobile technology and you're actually bringing it into your own sort of fashion a little bit. So for Saturn, we decided to take both of these trends of the digital world becoming more physical and more real and the real world becoming much more interactive and try to create an experience for them that was different. You know, the thing with car marketing is the dealerships are so strong and so powerful. And when dealers are bad or they're sort of sleazy, they have this perception, it can be very heavy handed. So we wanted to create an experience to showcase what well, was a really great new car, but involve the dealers in a little bit different way. So we went to NextFest and we created a really interesting experience of digital technology that I'm just going to play the video and I'll explain it as we go through it. So it was a hybrid car, and it was the first affordable hybrid car. It wasn't a very expensive one. The Saturn is a fairly low priced uh, car. So we created a wall that was fully interactive. We projected on top of the car itself and allowed you to peel away the inside of the car and see the components in a really simple way. You could enter in what does a hybrid mean to you, what's it going to help you do in your life. A strand of grass grows and your comment has added to that. The whole board is touch sensitive so you can just walk in front of it and move the whole thing. So he's not touching it, he's just it's through infrared that he's passing in front of it. And then we mapped the surface of the car itself and projected video onto it. And people can control a kiosk and actually peel away layers of the car. See how the hybrid technology works, how it interfaces with everything. And then we brought the dealers in as holograms. So you saw right in the beginning there was a sort of 
visual screen. There's several of them here. There's your glass panels. And just kind of like the HP spot a little bit, the dealers open up and talk about different things about hybrid technology. Now this is very different for Saturn because they are used to their sort of brick and mortar stores. And they actually took that technology of peeling away the insides of the car and turned it into a dealership thing that is now in, I think, a dozen or so different of their major dealers. So their dealers got a tool out of this. We created a really high level brand experience by doing something at NextFest, which is seen as an innovative place to be. Um, it's an experiment. We worked with a company called Obscura Digital. They are sort of mad scientists with technology. And the big premise we had was, can we think about video outside of a square? And that led to actually putting video on the car itself. And I'm not quite sure. I think 30,000 people were at NextFest. Um, four or 5,000 submitted comments as those strands of grass. That was then up on the website as well. And it became a little bit of sort of consumer-generated content and uh, a different kind of interactive experience. So interactive that's not online. So the last thing I'm going to show is um, sort of off the menu, but it's something we didn't do for a brand. We actually did it more for ourselves as a statement of how marketing could hopefully have an impact beyond just selling a product. So actually at, at Google Zeitgeist, um, I guess it was last month, Rich Silverstein and I met Ariana Huffington, the very sort of uh, very opinionated blogger, um, very liberal. And we learned about the Huffington Post. And we, we had an interesting thought. Rich Silverstein said, what if you could TiVo the last seven years of American politics and the world as it is and play it back to the American people without comment and let them connect the dots from that? But that very phrase was really interesting. So she posted this thought. We created these posters that were around three different themes, slogans, phrases that have been sort of turned into these very political statements, people who have been responsible for it, and places and events that have sparked a lot of controversy. And so we created these posters that she then blogged about. We didn't comment on them. We just designed them well and put this as a narrative of some of these events that have happened in the last seven years. So this was Albert Gray, Powell Burton, climate change, intelligent design, Katrina. We did one for the slogans, things like axis of evil, Gathering threat, shock and awe, the last throws, cut and run. And then we did one with some of the people that had been responsible for this. We took a very, very clear political view. But the point was, we worked with Ariana Huffington on her blog. If we had done this as a poster and put it up on the side of a wall, it probably wouldn't have had the impact. A thousand people commented and actually added their own phrases to it that we didn't include. And so we now have a new poster that's about 12 feet long, and it continues on very, very long. And we're going to take that and probably put that on the side of of a New York City skyscraper and continue to kind of blog about it and use social media to kind of make this issue relevant. Whether you agree with the politics or not, what's interesting is being able to work with bloggers and actually use social media to talk about something like this. And the final tagline at the bottom is, haven't we had enough Democrats 08? Simple call to action. But we got a lot of reaction from people. And I think seeing that kind of reaction from a simple concept but using that, that medium was really different for us. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you.